a pamphlet was once handed to me outside the clinic that said, women who have abortions are more likely to, sorry, are more likely to sexually abuse their children. And women are receiving this information, trying to access healthcare. I wanted to be a vet for the majority of my life and I did a lot of work experience with animals and my favourite thing about animals was birth. I really enjoyed calving, I loved lambing, um, puppies, I mean you know who doesn't love baby animals um, and so I decided well I like birth so much I, I reckon I can probably do it with them, um, with humans. Birth is amazing. Birth is like, it's unbelievable. And it's even more unbelievable when it's humans. Like it's, it's, it's insane. If you've ever been out of birth or, you know, birthed, you will, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. Babies coming into the world, it's, it's incredible. I've worked in every single aspect of midwifery that, that you know, that, that you can think of. Um, um, and it was only when the rumblings began in, in, in Ireland and it was only when I suddenly could see this, this change was hopefully coming that I just decided to reevaluate what my role meant to me. And I'm a carer of women and pregnant people. That's what my midwife means. Um, and I said, right, I need to get into abortion services. That's, that's what I need to do because I think there is just vulnerability and the isolation that comes from the way the services are run at the moment, the support needs to be there. I still do a bit of both, so I work um, mainly in, in, in abortion services, but I also, um, I, I also still do one day a week then um, to work with my clients who decide to continue with their pregnancy. Um, and it's a, it's a really lovely balance. Could you explain to me what abortion is? Abortion is ending an unwanted pregnancy. So, I mean, it ranges from, it ranges from, I have one child already, I don't want another, I have two kids already, I, I, I can't afford another, I have three, I don't, I hadn't planned for a fourth. Um, sexual assault, um, you, a planned pregnancy, and then suddenly life circumstances change and this isn't going to be possible. It's it, like, you, you name it. The difficult thing that, that I have with it is I, I don't think that women and pregnant people should need to tell their reason. For women who are living in a place where abortion is not legal, what options do they have? When we think back to kind of mid-century and we think about backstreet abortions and a, a lot of kind of that image of like um, a, a wire hanger is kind of used a lot and I think it's, you know, that, that imagery is particularly strong and, and quite, quite challenging. But backstreet abortions can be done, usually it would be just getting medicines from unregulated sources, so online or, um, yeah, to, through the internet mainly. Or you could travel, you, you, you could go abroad and that's what the majority of women do. Every single flight, they reckon, between Ireland and the UK had somebody travelling for a termination, like since forever. And what, what does that do to somebody, just to kind of take off and land in a different country and be treated by another country and then fly back home? And you have to pretend it didn't happen because it's a criminal offence. If we think about nowadays clients in Ireland who have a pregnancy with a, a, a fatal abnormality, so they've been told the likelihood is, is that their baby will not survive when their baby's born. There is not a provision in the Republic of Ireland to help those clients. So they have to get on planes and fly to the UK to receive health care. In Ireland, there is this three day mandatory wait period that they put in. They've plucked this figure from the sky. Somebody has walked in and just said, we need another little bit of red tape, we need another hoop, let's just create this three day number. So what that means is a client will go or speak to her healthcare professional, usually her GP, 
hopefully her GP is pro-choice because there is this whole thing where they can object and not provide health care if they wish. And then she decides she wants to have a termination. She discusses this with her healthcare professional and her healthcare professional says, right, come back to me in three days. And she has to wait 72 hours. And for some clients that will take them over the 12 week mark. So that means they can no longer have treatment in Ireland. There's so many little things that are just infuriating and really upsetting and they do not belong in the 21st century. And for every single person impacted by these ridiculous, nonsensical limitations they have on the service, they are mentally and physically going to be affected. It's so damaging to mental health, physical health, having to do that. Um, you know, what other choice do they have? I wonder, what is the three-day kind of rule there for in their eyes? It's just, there is absolutely zero evidence to support this three-day wait. I guess it's this whole thing of, well, you need more time. As if, you know, as if we don't think about what we would do in an unplanned pregnancy. Your period's late, you think about it. You know, you, 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 you worry and think, you, you, we assess this every single day of our lives. It's always something that's on the back of your mind about how, how you would manage your health. Of course, women and pregnant people will make the right decision for themselves. And of course, when they come to you, this is what they want and you have to respect that. That is their choice. But no, you need three more days. Can you recall any cases of women who have died because of lack of access to abortion or, or through getting an illegal abortion? In 2012, a woman, Savita Halapanavar, died. And she died because she was 17 weeks pregnant and she was miscarrying. So the pregnancy was ending, but there was still a heartbeat. And she was becoming septic. And we know that sepsis is one of the greatest killers of, of women and pregnant people. And by, I think, the second day from when she attended the hospital, she started asking if she could have a termination. Um, and she was refused um, because that was, that was the law. And a comment was made um, by one of her healthcare professionals um, when she was asking for a termination. And a comment was made stating, this is a Catholic country and we don't do that. Um, she passed her pregnancy um, and then she went into a coma and then she died at like one o'clock in the morning in October in 2012. And it was actually the hospital that I just started working in. I just qualified and I was uh, um, on my little temporary midwifery contract. And at the time, you know, when you heard about it, it was shocking, but it wasn't that shocking. Not that I didn't think about it again, but you know, it's it's the nature of the job that we do is that there are, you know, things happen. Um, and she was essentially, she was it. She was, she was the reason why women in Ireland can now have terminations. So she changed our constitution. And so we owe everything to her, but she just, she just died from not having basic reproductive health care. It's so weird to, it's so weird. Like we, we, there's a lot of loss in, in, in our job. As midwives, we, we, as well as the amazing, wonderful, happy times, we see a lot of loss and we see a lot of bereavement, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm okay. But even at the time, you, you just go through the motions with it and you, you accept it as part of your job. Any one of us could have been Civita. Um, but I think the reason why I'm crying more is because of the positive impact that she had. Um, and like the, ref, the, the weekend of the referendum, it's actually coming up to the, the three year mark. <laughs> I'm sorry. <sighs> it's coming up to the three year mark at the moment. Um, and they're doing now, they're, they're having a consultation that they, it was written into the legislation that there needed to be a three year review. And that's coming up now. And I just think we need to keep that momentum going and we need to just make it better and better and better because, you know, there still are 
clients who are, there is many clients who, who are still being forgotten and are still being exported. And that's it, we're exporting a problem instead of just identifying and dealing with it here head on, sorting it out and just normalising it. Could you um, explain to us what a pro-lifer is? Um, I prefer to call pro-lifers anti-choice because I believe I am pro-life and I am pro-life the life of the pregnant person requesting a termination. Um, so anti-choice are the people who do not agree with abortion. They don't agree with total reproductive health. And I will say that you are absolutely entitled to your opinion with anything, absolutely. But what you are not entitled to, and what I feel very strongly about, is you are not entitled to stand outside clinics and force your opinion on clients who are seeking reproductive health. And that's where I get very annoyed. But I have friends who are anti-choice and we get on fine. And I have, it's, it's like somebody coming to me and trying to change my opinion about abortion. It just isn't gonna happen. So I can totally appreciate that. But what I don't think that you are entitled to do is to force your opinion. And you, it is physically forced to give misleading information. A pamphlet was once handed to me outside the clinic that said, women who have abortions are more likely to, sorry, are more likely to sexually abuse their children. And women are receiving this information, trying to access healthcare. You are entitled to your opinion, absolutely. And we need opinions and we need difference of opinion. It's really healthy to have debate, but you cannot debate somebody else's or force your opinion on somebody else trying to access healthcare. That is not right. One in six, I believe, GPs or doctors in Ireland who are providing termination services have been harassed and abused and received threatening behaviour. Um, like, pro-life? Nah, it's not on. D did you ever have any reservations about working in the industry? I didn't think about it twice, no. Not, no, not even a rumbling of it. Um, it's just, I've, I've, I've unbelievable job satisfaction working in this job because you are removing someone from a crisis instantly. Like the, the gratitude and the relief that you are giving to another human being, it's, it's incredible. No, I've never even had a second thought on it. You all know somebody who's had an abortion. You probably know several people who've had an abortion. One in four of us have had an abortion and abortions will continue to happen at that rate, whether or not they are legal and regulated and local. They will still occur, but in more dangerous sort of circumstances. And I think we all have a responsibility to make this just a really normal part of our healthcare. It is safe and it is normal and it is everywhere. I remember the senior investigating officer from the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard, he got hold of me and uh, he said, we reckon there's probably about 30 victims. I went, no. I said, 500 victims? I said, that's probably what it's more like. And don't forget, I've been investigating Savile now for a year.